Thank you for joining us on today's webcast on state and federal legislation impacting public pensions. My name is Hank Kim, and I'm the Executive Director and Counsel for the National Conference on Public Employee Retirement Systems. Today's program is part of our Center for Online Learning. The purpose of the NCPERS Center for Online Learning is to provide remote continuing education to public pension trustees, staff, and other fiduciaries and stakeholders. Over the course of today's webcast, we will review state and federal legislation from the first half of 2016, preview what may happen in the second half of this year, and discuss the impact of state and federal elections in this presidential year. Joining me today are two familiar figures from our past webcast, Belly Childers, Executive Director of the National Public Pension Coalition, NPPC, and Tony Rota, partner at the law and lobbying firm of Williams & Jensen. Welcome to you both. The format we will follow today is a moderated conversation with our two panelists covering select state and federal legislation. We encourage audience participation by submitting questions to our panelists by sending emails to Amanda Rock, NCPERS Manager for Social Media and Communications at Amanda at ncpers.org. However, to ensure that we can cover as many topics as possible, we will hold all questions till the last part of the program. We have a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. And this time, Tony, I'm going to start with you. Uh, I think there's been a lot of activity here in Washington, D.C., uh, particularly in, in Congress. So why don't you just begin by telling us about uh, one of the um, more uh, notable ones. Sure, Hank. Happy to do it and happy to be here with Bailey again. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's great to be back. And there has been a lot in the first six and a half months to the year. And it actually goes back, I would say, to December of 2015 when we were, um, you know, moving toward the end of that first session of the Congress and uh, Senator Hatch introduced his legislation on Puerto Rico. And as, uh, as folks will remember, S-2381 contained two provisions that were not related to the situation in Puerto Rico, uh, but would have impacted public pension plans in the states. Maybe, Tony, just, uh, you may want to just explain what's going on in Puerto Rico that's necessitating uh, federal legislation. Puerto Rico, the territory, has um, tremendous debt. Uh, that's been incurred over the years, and attempts have been made to get out from under the debt uh, through various policy changes, but nothing has really secured uh, a way out. And, and Puerto Rico is not, as a territory and not a state, um, states are allowed under our federal laws to grant to their municipalities the ability to use bankruptcy protection. Puerto Rico did not have this, so they were in a particularly difficult situation. Uh, so difficult that Congress, in fact, did intervene. Senator Hatch's bill was really the beginning of it, um, but then this year uh, legislation has been enacted, uh, signed by the President to provide an oversight board and a way out of the, the debt situation. Uh, the bill did not include the two provisions that Senator Hatch had in his original bill that would have been aimed at state and local plans, uh, commonly known as PEPTA the Public Employee Pension Transparency Act, which re would require um, plans, plan sponsors to recalculate their funded status and provide that information to the Treasury Department. Um, that doesn't sound so bad, but the recalculation has to be done using fair market value of assets and a Treasury bond yield curve, which will make even the best funded pension plans look very poorly funded. And the other provision that was not included in the final product, the annuity accumulation plan, while optional for plan sponsors, we see it as being uh, put out there as a potential replacement and substitute for defined benefit plans. And it would allow a plan sponsor to purchase uh, annuities uh, for each employee each year. And that that would be the benefit. There would be no other uh, pension uh, related benefit for those employees and we're concerned about it uh, on a couple of standpoints. Uh, one, there are no survivor or disability benefits for uh, public safety. There are no employee contributions, which really runs mm -hmm. counter to how uh, public plans are funded today. And there's an uh, inconsistency potential in how the employer, the plan sponsor, funds the plan. So um, as a replacement, we see it. We see a lot of concerns. I know NCPERS has been very vocal about it. Mm -hmm. So um, Puerto Rico being 
that Senator Hatch identified as the vehicle to carry these provisions, that it did not, in fact, carry them, has been uh, a success for our community. Great, great. So continuing on that theme of uh, successes, uh, I remember when we were back here uh, six months ago, you had a laundry list of states where we had concerns. Can you give us an update on where we are uh, middle of July? Yeah, sure, I'm happy to. And thanks again for having me. It's great to be back on the panel with you both. Um, so it's actually been another very good year in the states for public pensions. Um, we actually had a couple of surprising proactive wins, which I want to talk about yeah. uh, because I think it's exciting. And maybe we'll give some folks that are watching ideas if they're looking for something to move next year. So first of all, in Wisconsin, um, they actually passed a bill that would allow a municipality that did not offer a pension to join the Wisconsin retirement system, which is a wonderful, yeah. fully funded, state-run system, and offer coverage to those municipal employees. So we actually saw pension expansion in Wisconsin, which I think a lot of people would agree is kind of surprising, but yeah. we were really happy about that. Um, and the bill, again, is going to allow these smaller municipalities um, to, to give pensions to their employees, which is fantastic. So that's one that we were very excited about in Wisconsin. And then in Oklahoma, we actually saw kind of a, a unique idea. Um, they created, for lack of a better way to describe it, a rainy day fund mm -hmm. for pensions. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was, in a good year, if a state's got some extra money, they can put it away in this rainy day fund. And then maybe in a future year, if we're in you know, a recession, which I'm sure someday that will happen again, um, or a year where they're having budget trouble, they could then help pay their full arc out of the rainy day fund or if things continue to be good, maybe even offer a cost of living adjustment out of that fund. So uh, they didn't put any money into the fund this year, but they created the mechanism to do it. And so I just I just think that's, again, a kind of a unique thing that's thinking about fiscal responsibility for the state moving forward. Um, the other, I think, kind of big picture good news is that public pension funding across the board continues to improve. Um, so as, as you both know, and I think many of the people watching know um, the, the the hits that pensions took during the recession, just like many mm -hmm. private accounts did, mm -hmm. um, have been a catalyst for people who want to get rid of pensions to say, well, we don't need to do this anymore, we can't afford it. But what we're seeing now, many years out, is that pensions are year by year, percentage by percentage, going back up in their funding status. And um, so as long as states are making their arc, making the payments like they're supposed to, the pension systems are recovering. And I think that's really a positive thing because I think it just shows these are systems that can weather an economic storm. You just have to give them time, which is often a lot of our message. And are you noticing that that's part of the change in the dialogue or the characterization of the plans, that because the funding ratios are getting better, that um, maybe the tax are, are diminishing or the, the characterization of them being drains on state budgets, that's changing or, or it, has it not like uh, penetrated down to that level yet? I think that it has helped in some ways. I think that there, you still got a group of folks that I'll talk about a little bit later who just who don't want to see pensions continue anymore. And so they've now moved um, actually to some of the kind of stuff Tony was talking about at the federal level where they're mm -hmm. trying to make pensions calculate on a different discount rate mm -hmm. just to make it look yeah. like they're unaffordable. So they've started <clears throat> to kind of move into this other set of tactics, yeah. which sometimes can be difficult because that's a very hard thing to explain to people, yeah, right? Absolutely. That's not an easy thing to talk about um, in the press or to the general public and sometimes even to a state state lawmaker, but I think we're starting to see those shifts in tactics because the argument that, oh, we can't sustain these pensions is, is really not going to be there for them anymore as they continue to recover post-recession. Okay. Um, so other than that, um, we did see a couple of attempts to move toward um, a hybrid model or a cash balance model in a couple of states. I'm happy to report that we were successful at stopping that um, in all the states that we saw it. Um, Alabama, there was a study commission that talked about doing a cash balance plan and that thankfully did not move forward this year. Um, Indiana had looked at an opt-out provision to give school districts the option to give a DC plan, a defined contribution plan to teachers mm -hmm. and we were able to defeat that. Um, we killed a hybrid in committee in Louisiana and then um, I think I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about Michigan and Pennsylvania when we look at what's still on tap for okay. this year. And what about Alaska? Because I, I think in January you were talking about the possibility of Alaska introducing legislation that might 
you know, again, as you talked about, as a proactive measure, go yes. back to the de uh, defined benefit. Uh, do you know what the status of that was? Um, it, it did not pass this year, but they got a committee hearing, and I think it did move a couple more steps than it's moved in the past. So I remain mm -hmm. hopeful that that's yeah. something we're going to continue to think about for next year and maybe maybe move there because they're one of the states that has really found that this experiment with moving to defined contribution doesn't do any of the things that people say it will, and they're still really struggling. So unfortunately, Alaska's got some other budget problems sure. yeah. um, that they're dealing with. But I, I think that's something that um, advocates are still going to be pushing for next session, which is exciting. Okay. So, Tony, turning back to you uh, at the federal level in Congress, um, obviously Puerto, Puerto Rico bill, a relief mm -hmm. bill, was, the, was a major driving force. But there are other couple of smaller provisions that uh, public plans should be aware of. Absolutely. Uh, one is a, a bill that was just introduced in June. Uh, H.R. 5427 by Congressman Dold of Illinois. And this is not a new issue, however. Congressman Dold was successful in attaching an amendment to the um, successor to No Child Left Behind, the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, in early 2015 in the House. That amendment and the bill uh, would say that a state that receives funds through the Elementary and Secondary Education Act could not require a local education association to pay more than the normal cost of a pension. And the bill goes on and the amendment uh, went on to say that normal cost cannot be any um, unfunded liability, any accrued unfunded liability. So you are, you're starving again, uh, the pensions. And the, the provision in the um, Student uh, Act in 2015 was not successful. It was in the House passed bill, but the Senate, through some work from our community um, about, about certain plans who have raised that this would be a very complicating factor in, in how they fund their pensions, uh, were able to get that provision knocked out before it made it into law. Uh, Congressman Dold has not left the playing field, however, and mm -hmm. has reintroduced his bill. Um, now here in the, um, in the middle part of the last session of the Congress. But um, the thing about Congressman Dold is, um, first, he's very articulate, uh, very persuasive, and he's also in a very competitive congressional reelection. Uh, so the House Republican leadership certainly wants to do things that uh, are, are helpful to Congressman Dold, a natural reaction. So we do, we do have concerns that this legislation could come to uh, the floor um, in, in September, uh, and we're going to be watching this very closely. So, Tony, uh, just a couple of questions regarding the Dole uh, bill. Uh, a, has there been any changes to it or modifications since its original introduction a year ago? And then two, what's the motivation uh, behind uh, Representative Dole's introduction of the bill? Well, on the first question, uh, there is a change and that he would exempt from this, uh, this requirement or prohibition, really, uh, any system that is, uh, is funded but more than 50 percent, 50 percent or greater funding. Um, we have some concerns about that because what he's put into his legislation is as determined using reasonable actuarial standards. Mm -hmm. right? We're really not sure. Uh, or assumptions, actually, is the word he uses. So we're really not sure what that's going to mean mm -hmm. um, and which federal regulator, in fact. This is legislation that would be amending elementary and secondary, so it's Department of Education. So where do they go to define this new term? Uh, so that is a concern of ours. Um, Congressman Dold is trying to, your second question, uh, fix a problem that he sees in Chicago where uh, school districts <clears throat> with um, very little and limited resources are being asked to incur these pension costs. And, you know, it is a difficult situation. I don't know that it's a situation that isn't um, it, it's certainly sympathetic, but I think the way he's going about it is, is not the correct way. Um, and we, in fact, our, our community is trying to meet with some of his education advisors who are really on the ground in the schools in Chicago to learn more about it, to see if there isn't uh, a better or different approach to, to solving it. Okay. Thank you. And then um, uh, 
was there another legislation? Well, I think we have to talk about the windfall elimination provision yeah. since that's the, the, the bill that has um, just recently been scheduled for markup at the House Ways and Means Committee uh, last week and then uh, withdrawn by the chairman. Um, the windfall elimination provision is one of the two Social Security offsets. So if you are an individual who earns a pension from a non-covered non -covered Social Security employment, such as, I believe, up to 25% of state and local employees, mm -hmm. um, your Social Security benefit, if you were able to earn one through a parallel or post-career employment, um, would be reduced by WEP, the Windfall Elimination Provision. It takes the first tranche of uh, your average monthly benefit from 90%, this first building block of your benefit, to 40%. So it's a sizable reduction. And it's, um, it's across the board, arbitrary, and has been in the law since the early 80s and really railed against consistently since then as being arbitrary. And legislation for uh, decades has been introduced to repeal. Repeal it um, carries with it a very high price tag and has never really gotten uh, traction. So Chairman Brady, Kevin Brady of the uh, Ways and Means Committee from Texas has, has taken a long-term interest in trying to solve this. He put together what he viewed as a compromise bill. Uh, it would have provided a rebate to those currently hit by WEP um, and those who will be hit by it um, or will turn age 62 uh, prior to the beginning of uh, 2018. And for those who reach age 62 from 2018 on, uh, the web penalty would be eliminated, but they would be their benefits would be calculated on a proportional basis. So, AARP, other groups have have said this is a fair approach, um, but the legislation hit um, some heavy uh, surf uh, last week when mm -hmm. an issue that was raised in the committee uh, dealing with uh, an exemption to the current web called the substantial earnings test uh, was not resolved. Uh, in the committee, in the chairman's mark, the bill he brought to the committee uh, for markup, and um, an amendment was going to be offered to fix the problem. That would have taken away a great deal of the rebate money, because Chairman Brady wants to keep this revenue neutral. Mm -hmm. So um, the better part of valor at that moment was to withdraw the bill and try to put it back together over this congressional recess. Okay. Uh, and, and Bailey, uh, at the state level, what are, what other news do you have for us? Uh, so you gave us some of the good, uh, the good. Uh, are there some of the ugly uh, and the bad <laughs> available? <laughs> yes, unfortunately, of course. Yeah. Um, so I, I, let me first talk a, a little big picture about some of the things we saw this year that were new uh, or continuing in the case of Pew. So I think as I've talked about before, Pew has taken money from the John Arnold Foundation and Arnold is a big, mainly the, the big anti-pension funder. So they have just re-upped the grant from Arnold. So they're close to $10 million now that they've taken from the Arnold Foundation. And we've seen them um, in Alabama this year. They were very active at trying to push Alabama toward a cash balance. We saw them in Pennsylvania again um, this year. So they had, they'd been in Pennsylvania last year pushing for um, what's called a side-by-side -side hybrid plan, mm -hmm. which basically means from dollar one of salary, part of your money is going to the pension parts, going into um, a 401k style plan. So this year in Pennsylvania, a stacked hybrid was debated, and that would be up until uh, I'm blanking on the ceiling. It was maybe fifty or sixty thousand dollars of salary. Mm -hmm. You have a pension, and then on top of that, you have a 401k. And Pew was still pushing to go to the side by side model. That would be much worse. Um, for public employees. Neither one of them are something that we necessarily want to see, but Pew is you know, still going at it trying to get Pennsylvania to, to make a worse decision for their public employees. Thankfully, that has not moved. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that it will. I don't have a good sense um, what the rest of the year is going to look like there. If it doesn't, you know, I expect maybe next year we may still see it again. But um, so that's just to say, you know, if you're seeing Pew in your state, please let us know. Um, the other kind of tricky part with Pew is they've, they've got a separate group now that's working on some of the stuff we talked about on the last webcast, which are the, the uh, private sector retirement security models to expand access to retirement security. Yep. So it's just a little tricky with them. They are, yeah. it is two separate sections of Pew, but just be aware, you know, if the 
if the what I would call the good side that's mm -hmm. coming in trying to help the private sector makes inroads with lawmakers, you may see the bad side come in yeah. the next year trying to get rid of um, public pensions. I've, I've heard that they are active in Kentucky as well. Um, they they um, were active there a few years ago, moving the Kentucky state employees to a cash balance, and, and the teacher system now is one that I hear that they may be doing some work on. So um, so that's, that's frustrating, <laughs> and yeah. we'll keep an eye on them. And again, if, if you hear of them in your state, please let us know so we can help um, help you uh, fight them back. Uh, we were very successful in Alabama, again, as I mentioned, so that was great. The other um, interesting group that has formed is called the Retirement Security Initiative, and it's headed mm -hmm. up by Chuck Reed and Dan Lillenquist and Lois Scott and a couple of other folks who've been involved in attacking pensions um, in Chicago, San Jose, and Nevada, or excuse me, Utah. And their new executive director, Pete Constant, came out of the, um, the Reason Foundation and has done a lot of anti-pension work. It's not exactly clear what they're doing. They unfortunately are organized as a 501c4, so we can't tell like mm -hmm. where their money's coming from. I could guess, but yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't we don't know exactly where their money's coming from or how active they're going to be. We saw them this year in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, uh, Chuck Reed went out to testify. Mm -hmm. Once we found out, we were able to get someone else to go testify, and thankfully Lincoln decided to stick with their pension system. So, so far it's RSI zero and MPPC one, so I'm yeah. happy about that. Good, but, good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've, they've named Pennsylvania, Arizona as other potential targets, and we think that they may be more interested in municipal pensions, which is very tough to track. Yeah. So um, just keep those names in mind. And again, if you're hearing them, if they're being invited to come testify to the city council or to committees at the state legislature, let us know um, again so we can make sure their motives are clear to the people they're coming to speak to. Um, so those are those are a couple of concerns, you know, just people still floating around mm -hmm. pushing these bad ideas for states and cities um, that we saw. And then, you know, for the rest of this year, again, Pennsylvania, that hybrid bill mm -hmm. is you know, it's not clear what's going to happen with that. And then Michigan, I think I've talked about the last couple times, so they've still got um, a bill to convert the public school employees to a 401k style plan. It has not moved at all this year. We think that it might move in lame duck, depending on how the elections go, but there also might be other priorities in lame duck and maybe they don't get to pensions. So uh -huh. that one we're continuing to monitor. We, we don't think at this point it will move until lame duck, but you know we're, that's a state that we constantly monitor. Okay. So uh, bottom line for the balance of 2016, most legislatures are shut down and gone into recess, but the two states that you're still keeping an eye on are Pennsylvania and Michigan. That's right, and those, those two states will still have limited session mm -hmm. days left yeah. because people will have elections, and right. so there'll be some work that I think that they do between now and November, but I think a lot of it will be focused on campaigning. And also, uh, re relative to the Retirement Security Initiative, RSI, the, they may be looking at the uh, sub-state level, sub-political divisions, right. uh, counties and cities, and so if, a state is looking, or a city is looking and, and seeing that they have some challenges coming up, what are the things that NPPC can do to assist uh, states or localities? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so, in, like I mentioned in the example of Lincoln, Nebraska, you know, we reached out proactively and said, look, can we get someone there to come and testify at the next city council meeting to make sure that they're hearing the other side and we're able to get um, an actuary to go out and talk about why moving to away from a DB mm -hmm. was not going to be helpful to Lincoln, Nebraska. And thankfully they found that argument to be very compelling. And so those are the kinds of things that we can help with if you let us know. Um, you know, we can talk about finding an expert or, you know, someone to come in uh, to make sure the other side is heard. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also happy, you know, in the mm -hmm. case of Pew, for example, um, we've done letters to all state legislators to say, just so you know, here's the deal with Pew when it comes to pensions. They're taking money from John Arnold. This is not a solution that's specific to your state. This is an agenda that they're pushing all across the country. And sometimes just, you know, outing them for doing that has been helpful at getting state legislators to say, oh, well, wait a second, let's really think about this yeah. before we listen to these folks and move forward. So we're happy to help prepare materials like that. We can do the same thing with the folks from RSI to make sure that lawmakers are aware of their backgrounds and their track records on pensions and how it hasn't worked. So Dan yeah. Lillenquist, for example, pushed through this hybrid in Utah and now they're having recruiting challenges for teachers and police officers because they don't offer mm -hmm. 
decent retirement <laughs> security anymore. And then they're, you know, they're shocked at why they can't find people to do these very, very important jobs. So you know, I think we can, we can put some of those kind of materials together for folks. We can help you think about preparing testimony or getting someone in for testimony, writing opinion pieces, and really doing that education that needs to be done to make sure people at least understand mm -hmm. where the information that they're getting is coming from. And, and, and speaking of information, how can an audience member who's interested in contacting you, uh, how do they get in touch with you? What's your web address, uh, contact information yeah, that you're willing to share? Sure. Um, so we're at protectpensions.org. Um, you can go there. We have a lot of resources on our website, um, so definitely feel free to check that out. We do a blog a couple of times a week just talking about different issues that are going on um, in the states. And then, or you can email me directly at bchilders at protectpensions.org. So it's B-C-H-I-L-D-E-R-S at protectpensions.org. Great, great. So, Tony, uh, turning back to you at the federal level, uh, what do you foresee for the balance of this year? Um, obviously, there's an election coming up, and we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit later, right. but <clears throat> relative to Congress, maybe sure. the agencies, uh, you know, what, what, what do you see for uh, sure. the second half? Well, Congress is, in, uh, is out of session for the next seven weeks, including this week. Of course, the Republican convention is this week, the Democratic convention is next week, and then they have their traditional August recess. So they'll come back on September the 6th, for approximately a month. And in that time, really, the only must-pass legislation is a resolution to fund the budget. Mm -hmm. So th there's, um, there's a push and a pull right now going on between how to do that, uh, those who want to see just a short term to get them into a lame duck session, and those who would like to see it punted until March uh, and have the new president and the new Congress uh, deal with the funding issues. So that's going to play out in September. It's very possible it would be just a short term uh, extension that'll take them over the hump, get them into uh, the lame duck session, and then they can work on on the, um, the, the serious number crunching. Uh, on our issues, and I'll go straight down the list as I did before, uh, Puerto Rico presented a legislative opportunity of convenience for Senator Hatch and those who would like to do uh, PEPTA, for mm. instance, the annuity accumulation mm. plan. Uh, there will be other uh, legislative measures which present this opportunity. Um, and we will be working to keep those provisions off of those bills. The, f the first is going to be uh, S-1714, which is legislation by Congressman Manchin of West Virginia dealing with shoring up uh, the pension and retiree health benefits for retired minors. Mm. And this is a, a bipartisan issue. Um, the Ohio senators, both Portman and Brown, Republican and Democrat, have been um, pushing for this. And Senator Hatch at Senate Finance did say, that he would mark up this bill in September. So right out of the chute, uh, we're going to have um, that defensive battle uh, again. Um, I feel pretty good about this bill. This bill has to be developed in a bipartisan fashion. The provisions I outlined before are not um, supported uh, on the Democratic side of the aisle, and, and perhaps some, uh, maybe many Republicans, would have difficulty with them as well. Um, the Dold legislation. Turning to that, um, again, uh, possibility that it could pass the House in September. He, he is certainly uh, pushing the leadership for that. Um, that will present a situation similar to what we had in 2015 where the House did pass it and the Senate stopped it. So that's something we have to see uh, how that plays out. And then uh, going to WEP, the windfall elimination provision for this short-term September period. Chairman Brady's working, I know, during the recess to try to put this back together, to try to find the support necessary to move it from the committee in a bipartisan way. He doesn't want to put a bill out there that's, um, that's purely partisan because it, it doesn't have a, a future, and he's committed to, to solving this. So I think those are three areas that we're going to be looking at in September and, and probably into the lame duck session as well. Okay. And, and let's talk a little bit about the lame duck session. <coughs> um, obviously, it's when uh, Congress comes back into session after the election. Um, and generally, that's when a lot of the cleanup bill happens, right? Or maybe some of the more unpopular decisions need to be made. Uh, so if that's the case, do you, it, it, again, for relative mm -hmm. to public pensions, um, do you see 
the more likelihood of a September issue, or is it more in November, December? I think um, the lame duck is always one with a big question mark attached to it, because you don't know what the voters are going to decide and what the political dynamic is going to be. It could be that we're looking at a new president. Well, we're looking at a new president either way, but we could be looking at a president of a different party. Yeah. Um, if we are, in fact, if, if uh, the Republican were to win, then you know you have a situation where he would probably not want Congress to be doing anything. I mean, perhaps take some politically uh, difficult issues off the table. With regard to our issues, I think largely they are issues that have to ride on other pieces of legislation. Um, so to that extent, there really has to be some bipartisan input to it. And as long as we continue to educate members of the House and the Senate on, on the concerns we have, I think uh, w we should continue to see success. It's not guaranteed, but mm -hmm. as long as we're doing our homework and doing the outreach that's necessary, uh, I, I believe we can keep these pieces of legislation at bay. Okay. So you kind of introduced it and touched on the topic. So let's go to the elephant that's in the room, the presidential election. So we have the presumptive nominees for both parties. Uh, you mentioned that there is a convention for the Republicans going on this week. The Hillary will have hers next week. Um, and we're not going to get into the larger issues and, and right. um, the politics <coughs> of that. But again, as it relates to public pensions and retirement security, what do we know, at least from the candidates or from the, the parties, about their positions on Social Security and retirement? That's a great question, and of course, very timely. Um, but they haven't said, Hillary Clinton has said more and has a longer track record on retirement issues, mm -hmm. certainly a, a, a strong supporter of Social Security. In fact, um, she has said that she would like to see the benefits enhanced for certain people who may be caring for an ailing family member um, or, or younger children or situations where they weren't able to really earn much of a benefit because they were out of the workforce for long periods of time caring for children. So she is open to all that. Um, she's also opening up uh, the possibility of raising um, the Social Security payroll cap, uh, which is currently set at $118,500. Uh, um, that is um, not been changed substantially since the early 90s, but it's been indexed over the years. Republicans usually draw the line there and say, no, new taxes, that's a new tax um, in their mind. Mm -hmm. that, that To increase the exposure to the FICA tax would be a new tax, and, and um, they've tried to take that off the table and, and largely have taken it off the table when they've been in the majority. Um, Donald Trump has said very little about retirement. Um, he has said very little about many policy areas, um, but, but this is one of them. Now, he has said very clearly that we should not be cutting Social Security benefits. And I think largely Republicans are looking at the demographic of their voting bloc, which is aging. And they're saying Social Security um, is a positive if we handle it correctly. So I think Trump is kind of showing that to... Um, to the American public and, and looking at the GOP platform, you know, who, who really reads a platform. Uh, but I read it in the cab coming over. And it's very spare on language with regard to Social Security, but it talks about the moral obligation to secure benefits. But it also says that all options should be on the table. Um, it does not mention privatization, nor would I expect it to mention privatization. Um, you could read that privatization or, or individual accounts is on the table if all options are on the table. Um, I don't think there's any traction for that in Congress. Um, so I don't really think that's a new threat. As I, as I mentioned earlier, they do make the no new taxes, um, mm -hmm. uh, draw that line in the sand. So um, I think we need to know a lot more um, about these candidates, particularly with regard to retirement policy, because there are so many large issues that are coming into play right now. Mm -hmm. And for you, Bailey, as the presidential election you know, casts its long shadow, yeah. what are you anticipating at the state level? How do you think it's going to color the, uh, the politics at the state level? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one of the big things we'll be watching for 
are flips of legislative chambers and uh, governor's mansions. And I think that could have a big impact mm -hmm. on what we're dealing with going into 2017 in some of the states that we've done work in the last couple of years. It might mean that we have states that are new threats. It might mean that we have states where we have some opportunities to do some, some more proactive work. It's, it's hard to say at this point mm -hmm. um, because I think yeah. <laughs> predicting anything this year has been really difficult as far as um, presidential politics and what that's going to mean down the ticket I think has also been a very interesting dynamic so far this cycle but that's some that's definitely something we're taking into consideration with the states that we work with regularly you know doing our planning and talking about you know we'll get let's let's chat after November so you have a good sense of what you're actually going to be dealing with and what the opportunities or threats may be. Um, the other thing that'll always be a challenge for us though is you're gonna have a lot of new legislators. Mm. So regardless, in, in a lot of our states, you'll have a crop of new people that you've got to do education because you know people have to understand what pensions are, why they matter, why they work well for the state, who's in a pension, you know, why does it matter for them and their retirement security that they have a pension rather than a 401k style account? So that's definitely something that we'll be doing. Even in the states where maybe we don't necessarily mm -hmm. expect a big threat, we've got to do that level of education to make sure that the new people coming in don't say, hey, I've got an idea, let's do pension reform. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, so, so we'll be doing a lot of work on that. And then we have a, for next year, we'll have a couple of states who weren't in session this year um, Texas and Nevada, two big ones that come to mind that will go back into session in 2017. So I think for the balance of this year, even prior to the elections, thinking about what we're doing to get ready um, for those two states coming back into session next year. Okay, okay, great, thank you. So uh, at this time, we'll be fielding some questions from uh, the audience. Uh, we have a couple of questions already keyed up uh, from folks uh, uh, that have sent it into Amanda. So again, uh, just as a refresher, if you'd like mm -hmm. to ask us a question, send an email to amanda at ncpers.org. So um, let me stay with you. Uh, so one of the first questions we got was in, re regarding Wisconsin and Oklahoma, sort of the, uh, the proactive legislation that became law that you mentioned. What, what were the origins of that? Was it, did the, did the state initiate that? Or was that by employees? How did that happen? That's a fantastic question. Uh, two different ways. So mm -hmm. Wisconsin, it was actually a Republican mayor um, who wanted to be able to provide a pension to the city employees in his city, went to his Republican lawmaker at the state level and said, hey, can we do this? And they said, sure, and did it. So <laughs> we thought, great, sure. yeah. we're not going to argue with that. Go yeah. right ahead. Mm -hmm. um, Oklahoma, the Retired Teachers Association came up with the idea to create the uh, rainy day fund. So uh -huh. uh, two very different paths. Mm -hmm. but both successful in very red states, so it's great. And is there any way of replicating that? Are there any lessons learned that you could share for, for either approaches or both approaches that uh, other states or you know, stakeholders could uh, try to m mimic? Oh, definitely. I think that's a great question. And, and one of the things that we want to put out a little bit later this year is kind of a proactive bill toolkit for states. So here's the model bill from Wisconsin and Oklahoma. If either of these make sense for you, I mean, states are going to have to decide if it's a if it's a, a thing that that makes sense for them to do, you know, in the Wisconsin example, if all of your municipal employees are already covered, it may not make sense to offer that. But if there's an opportunity to get more people covered by giving them access to the state system, there may be ways that um, a state could work to do that. So we want to put those together along with um, NERS, the National Institute for Retirement Security, just released a report last week on portability. So that's whether or not uh, you could take your pension service credits with you to a new state if you move. Um, to another job. A lot of states do offer portability, which is surprise, you know, I think was surprising to me, which because our opponents claim they don't, mm -hmm. right? So that's one of their reasons for saying, oh, you should be in a 401k because right. you can move that with right. you. As it turns out, a lot of pension systems also offer portability. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another place we could look if you're in a state that doesn't. Can we start doing some work to say, okay, well, let's make it where if we're in, I, I'm just going to make this up because I, I don't know state by state, but if we're in Missouri and someone from Kansas moves here, can we make sure they're getting service credit for t being a teacher in Kansas or for being a police officer in Kansas? Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, those kind of three ideas of, of proactive legislation are stuff we'd like to give to states and, and help them with if they're interested in doing it. Okay, good. So, Tony, um, over the weekend, there was a, an editorial in the Washington, uh, or I'm sorry, in the, uh, the Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. uh, saying that one of the things that uh, Congress should do in 2017 is to help uh, those pension plans that are uh, 
chronically underfunded is for Congress to pass legislation that would allow them to cut benefits. Um, obviously, we disagree with this editorial on a number of different levels, but um, are there, is there any you know, credible threat about any sort of legislation along those lines of permitting states to cut benefits and essentially undermine the state's constitution? The Manhattan Institute also put out a couple months ago a similar approach through the bankruptcy code. We talked about yeah. it, um, where um, states would be allowed to uh, grant the authority to the municipalities, I believe, to uh, cut benefits where their uh, essential services were being threatened funding, right? They didn't have enough money to fund the essential services, so they had to cut over here over here being the pensions. These ideas, um, you know, it depends very much on what kind of hand uh, the voters deal us. And if they deal us a Republican president and two solid Republican majorities uh, in Congress, I think that it could be a serious threat. Uh, I think that they would probably, much like the Dold Amendment has been um, revised, try to um, carve out this treatment being applied only to those who are in the most serious um, straits with regard to funding. To the extent you are going to need bipartisan support, however, to do anything in the Senate, because if the Republicans are going to hold their majority in the Senate, they're going to hold it just by the skin of their teeth. They're not going to have the 60 vote margin. So mm -hmm. you do have that, um, that potential block to um, you know, kind of runaway legislation in this area. Um, you know, in my view, and, and other, uh, other folks have raised this, it would seem that Congress should really take care of the defined benefit plan that it created first, being Social Security. And I think that's probably going to be part of our, you know, rhetorical approach to, mm -hmm. to this whole issue. Um, the federal defined benefit plan should be taken care of first by the federal government. Uh, before it tries to dig into what's going on in Topeka or Springfield or, or anywhere else in the country. Okay. I also want to add to that. Yes. So um, I was discussing that Wall Street Journal piece with someone yesterday. Five, there are only five states that fall under the threshold that that piece was talking about yeah. that it would even apply to. Mm -hmm. And so this is, again, where I think the folks on the other side are really deliberate about trying to make everyone think there's this big pension crisis right. when, in fact, there, there is in a couple of states. But right. it's really limited to a very small number of states. Um, so I thought that was fascinating. That would really only apply to five. Mm -hmm. So why, um, why even do that? And then, you know, another thing I just want to throw out along these lines, NASRA looks at the average percentage of state and local budgets um, that's going to pension costs, and the average percentage is 4.1%. And right. I think, again, our opponents right. would make you think it's 60%, right. it's bankrupting the state and city, we can't fill potholes, right. but it's just not true um, when you look at the numbers. Well, again, you know, it's, it's, the, it's a commentator, and he, he likes to conflate the figures, exactly. and so he talks about the four, supposedly the $4 trillion of debt, mm -hmm. but it conveniently fails to mention the $3.6 trillion of assets, exactly. right? So right, it's right. not, you know, it's, it's not exactly. as big as uh, <clears throat> he, he makes it out to be. Yep. Tony, uh, last question is in regard to the Dole uh, mm -hmm. bill. Um, if you're concerned about it, you know, from a plan perspective or as a stakeholder, w what should or can they do to help uh, the, the community? Uh, that's an excellent question. I think right now it's, it's very much an inside baseball game. Um, I think we're going to, I think folks in key states could reach out to their um, to their members in the House. I think Minnesota, because Chairman Klein of the Education and Workforce Committee um, is a, a Minnesotan. Um, we have worked closely with um, Chairman Rowe from Tennessee, who is the subcommittee chairman on pensions uh, over at the Education and Workforce Committee, um, to educate him on the, the complications, really, that this is going to create. Um, Tennessee has in its new hybrid program, uh, similar to what Oklahoma has done, but they have a stabilization reserve fund. And there, mm -hmm. the, there were concerns about how this could be funded and still adhere to um, the confines of the Dold Amendment. Mm -hmm. So I think Minnesota and Tennessee are very important states. The Republican leadership 
uh, certainly, th they can be made known um, about this. Um, Paul Ryan from Wisconsin and uh, Kevin McCarthy from California would be key, I think, in that. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you both for joining me. Uh, again, I think it's been another great session, very informative about what's going on at the state and federal level. And uh, I look forward to joining you guys again six months from now in January to see where we are. <laughs> Sounds great. Very good. Well, thank, thank you so you much, have. everyone. And uh, we'll sign off uh, for now. But uh, again, as we mentioned, uh, please join us in January when uh, we do a preview of uh, 2017. Thank you.